Sorry, there's a lady down here in the cream jacket at the end of the row, just where you're standing there, yeah. And if you wouldn't mind maybe introducing yourselves when you're, you're asking the question where you're coming from. I'm Gorham McKinney, and um, I'm retired really now, but I have a long history in this particular field, and I'm the honorary president of Europe Against Drugs. I've retired as president. I'd like to congratulate CAD on what they have done today. And I'm wondering, are any advisors to our drugs minister here today? Because as a citizen of this state, I'm genuinely, I, they, we've had wonderful speakers, and I have traveled, as Kevin knows, extensively in this field. Today is one of the best conferences I have ever sat through. And I feel upset as a citizen of this state, where we have a drugs minister and a health minister promoting drug decriminalization, not knowing what they're talking about, and that they're not here today to learn. We're all learning. Just because we get a fine post as a minister or a junior minister, it shouldn't stop our learning. And I'm very disappointed that there isn't somebody here. I wrote to many politicians advising them of this. I wrote personally to the Minister for Health as the children's minister, and you spoke so much about protecting children, Kevin. And I wrote to him about, on this subject and asked if he would meet with Dr. Sabat when he was here. And our Minister for Health, of course, is a medical doctor. He didn't even reply to my mail. And that has been the general thing. And I am very, very worried that drug decriminalization with the promotion of normal students for sensible drug policy the International Harm Reduction Association, which are active in Ireland, all friends of our friend um, Virgin Records. Richard Branson, can I just I ask? can't forget that, that, that they're, they are promoting, and I'm hoping that people here today who have learned so much will go back to their neighbourhoods and speak to their politicians and say, absolutely not, we will not promote, we will not vote for you if you decriminalise drugs in our state. Okay, thank you very much, Gronia. Can I just ask the audience, is there any representative here from the Department of Health, from the Department of Children, no. from the government? No. Okay, so Gronia, there, there is nobody here. Bernie, I presume these people we were, were invited, invited, were they? Yeah, they were, yeah. And we were told that somebody from the DPU would be here, but that hasn't happened. Okay, well, we do have a representative from Garda Siakana here, and we have the commissioner here, but government, that's very interesting, government departments opted not to take part in this. Um, are there other questions here from the floor now for any of our speakers? This, this lady here in the Navy jumper. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering, Kevin, how did the US manage uh, Colorado and places like that to get marijuana, medical marijuana legislated when it's against the EU conventions and the EU law? How does that loophole happen? And it was America that started like the marijuana madness stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So the, right. Well, if you bring up a couple of good, even just by saying that, because I think, yeah, I mean, you know, a hundred years ago, there were times where we over exaggerated the harm. So you're talking about like reefer madness. And that's why my book's called Reefer Sanity, because I want to move on from that history and, you know, um, understand that, uh, you know, I know some people can be cynical about what government tells them regarding something. But I tell people, don't listen, don't take my word for it even. Certainly don't take government's word for it. Look at the scientific groups and the major medical associations, the public health authorities, and what they're saying about this, um, you know, is what we're saying. And so how did this happen? Uh, you're exactly right. It's against both federal law in the United States to sell just, you know, call something medicine, even call this water medicine without it going through some proper, you know, controls. And it's also against international law. And how did we do it? Um, they just did it because they had, um, you know, deep pocketed billionaires who funded referendum in states. And, you know, authorities said, you know, this is illegal, but okay, you, I guess you're going to vote on something. And though they cleverly worded it because they didn't say prescribe marijuana because you can't prescribe something that doesn't have medical value. They said recommend medical marijuana. And again, you know, in the United States, when we became a free country in 1776, the first thing people wanted to do was say that free speech is so important, and that is the First Amendment, <laughs> free speech. So you cannot tell anybody, unless you're yelling fire in a theater, you cannot control someone's speech. So you can't control if, uh, you know, somebody wants to say, I recommend marijuana. And so they were able to sort of go through that loophole 
and um, sort of, you know, do this without, I mean, there have been some enforcement here and there, but clearly it's spreading, even though it's violating both federal and international law. Can, can I ask a question uh, to Des Corrigan on the back of that question? Under the current existing drug le legislation in Ireland, it, would that be possible here? Could it go to the state uh, that Colorado, for example, is in? No, it, the, it, the um, Misuse of Drugs Act would have to be repealed. Okay, so that is, that is yeah. not a realistic prospect and here also the, in terms poisons, of decriminalisation. The Poisons Act would have to be repealed and the Irish Medicines Board Act would have to be repealed. Right. Because you can't have, you can't have one set of standards for medicines and another set of standards for recreational drugs. Okay. Yeah. Kevin, you want to add something? I mean, we have those similar <laughs> laws too. It's just that people decided not to enforce them. And, and that's the strange thing. And people don't realize, I think, in the U.S. that these laws aren't really being enforced. So we have, oh, trust me, we have a lot of laws in the books on this, but it's just that, you know, the big money has come in, they're funding the politicians, and the people say, all right, we're not going to enforce the law. And now, well, you know, we're having a big presidential election, obviously, in the U.S., and uh, I mean, it's impossible to get away from it. It's so long, and, you know, so, but um, the, it's sort of difficult even for a candidate, even though it's against federal law, it's difficult for a candidate to say, we're going to go in and enforce the law in Colorado because people have images of, you know, tanks rolling in and, you know, arresting, which wouldn't happen. But th so there's sort of this, even though it is against federal law, there's kind of this very still the strong states' rights issue. Even though the courts have said there's no such thing as states' rights with drugs because drugs affect different states or transported across states, this is a federal matter. Still, states have done this. It's a very strange thing. It's fascinating, that, isn't it? Are there more questions uh, from the floor on this issue? This lady here in the third row there. And as I say, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself where you're, where you're I'm from. I'm just a parent. I'm a parent, uh, and my daughter's uh, going to Josette College. Um, Mike, I have two girls. Um, my concern would be the education end of it, because at the moment, everybody's grand. Um, we all go through our, I have a 14 and an 18-year-old, so I've been through hormonal. One was five, the other is a bit up and down. Mm. It's the trying to get the message through. Like, I've been educated today. I don't know if my daughter is educated. I, don't, I have told her what I've said, but Mammy says things. But it's different when they hear it from the likes of a lecturer, or somebody, you know, that say, oh yeah, mammy, you know, mammy said this, but the teacher says, you know, the teacher said, they come home and tell you, mammy, the teacher says this, that and the other. I think education is, is a big, big major part that this country is missing. A major part, and started now, softly, softly, like we do with the sex education, like we do with the um, plastic bag education, the simple things, that's how we move on and we progress. It's, it's the same when we change money, we change the decimal thing. We moved by the simple thing. Drugs, we can educate from, start little steps, start little steps early. And I think my 18-year-old isn't educated enough at this stage in her life. She's not educated enough, enough of what I've learned today to go out in the world, she's going to be socialising on her own. I have no say in it. Mm. I have completely no say in what she does. If she's, um, I'm hoping that my skills, that, you know, that I've given her, but I can't say I've given her everything either. Um, but the, uh, cause I don't know everything, the skills. I think they need to hear, they need to hear the effects. They need to hear what it's doing to the human brain. As the last question was, you know, do we want a society that nobody wants that society? But I feel in this country, they may be promoting it in the jails. Mm -hmm. Can we put that question maybe to Bernie? I mean, in terms of the early intervention in terms of education in our primary schools, what is happening and what is the, the Department of Education, for example, saying to proposals like mm -hmm. yours? Um, I think uh, we will be getting an update, we, we'll be hearing more this afternoon from um, 
total blank on the lady's name, Dory, Dory Holland. Um, she's talking about well-being. This is the new heading under which social, personal health education uh, programmes are actually delivered. Um, and they're linking it very much into mental health and well-being. So I think that's important. We start here in primary school and it's, um, there's the uh, Walk Tall programme. Um, and then from, can you hear me? Yeah, no, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, from from uh, people coming from outside. But you see, it was fa it was found in evaluations that the teachers were the best people to deliver the programs. Now, other people have um, objections to that and reservations to that. But that's what initially was found. And the reason they said that the teacher was the best place was, if I'm invited into a classroom, I don't know those children. I have no idea of their backgrounds. I have no idea who's maybe three very savvy young people on one side, maybe totally three, three naive people on the other. And it's trying to gauge then, well, what level of information do you, do you, you give it at? So it's, it's not a straightforward, it's not a straightforward thing. Um, we certainly found that any time that we've been involved in stuff that's, that's linked, uh, and any of the colleagues that I, we would have met in the Drug Education Workers Forum, they take their work very, very seriously. There's quality standards associated with it. Um, there's uh, good practices adhered to, and um, it, but it must complement what's going on in the classroom. So you can't go in there thinking you've everything, you know, because that's not not what the case will be. I mentioned yesterday about when we're do delivering work with uh, older teenagers and early school leavers and young, vulnerable young people, and um, just to give one example of how we do with cannabis, and Paula and I would work together with with the group. We'd split the group in two. We take one each. But we wouldn't ask them to list the problems associated with cannabis. We actually ask them to list why do people give up using cannabis. So that means you're engaging with them. They have to think now. It's not just something. And then we have we, we bring it back to the main, you know, and we we pit one group against the other. Oh, we we've, we've got more than that other group and that. And but you're trying to as as Kevin and and Des have said before, we're engaging young people in these conversations. So you're trying to plant seeds that hopefully you can build on then, you know, at at, um, at later times. Um, I don't know whether that answers the and question. Bernice, but just to follow up on uh, the point you were making, really, that there wasn't enough being done. Would you yeah. say there's enough not is enough? Being no, done? I would agree. No, I would agree on that. Yeah, I would. Promotes, sorry, just media promotes loads of different things. Like at the moment, it's whether um, the, the tea shop is, you know, uh, all promoted. I won't go into. Uh, but more, this is the well-being, the brain, and yeah. we say we're going to go to. Brain, you know? No, there's definitely not enough being there's delivered. Enough. I mean, it's a tiny proportion of the curriculum that goes to this topic. But as parents, we are the primary educators. Um, and I think... I know, but you would agree, because I know you were one of my parents, and I know, I, I, and I know. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the thing. There's a huge... Um, I mean... The adults that are around today didn't get drug ed education in their curriculum. It just wasn't on the cards at, at that time. So most adults haven't a clue really about this subject. And it's so complex. Um, so it just, I, I totally agree. I think the way we, we need education right across the board needs to be improved. We need to find more ways of engaging, of tapping in. Like I was saying with the, the, um, the Trinity results there in the last third level survey, Tim Bingham's one, um, where you had 50% had of Trinity students had uh, tried drugs, but 50% hadn't. So talk to that 50%. What was it that influenced you not to get involved in this? You know, and try and work one to help the other. I just want to ask something too. You know, um, in 1983, we in the United States, we had a very scary thing that woke up the American people to drugs because before, in the 1970s, it was marijuana and heroin, and heroin was back and forth. People weren't that scared. Um, heroin was a very small proportion of the population. But in 1983, something happened. That something was crack cocaine, and it woke up communities. Government wasn't doing enough. Communities came together and said. We are, we, you are work for us. Remember that, right? You work for us. 
We demand that we have more education. We demand that you fund community groups that are not just schools, because if you, as Des was the, one of the best points, you can't only do this at schools. It has to be a community-wide effort. You know, communities were coming together and saying, listen, we have to have the businesses in our community engage in this, because they're employing young people in the summer. We have to have the parents understand the problems. We need law enforcement to sit here with the treatment centers to tell us what's going on, with the prevention. All of these different sectors, we call them, need to come together around a table and plan all kinds of prevention activities in the community. And, you know, it took some time, but eventually, you know, there were there are now thousands of what they, they call these local anti-drug coalitions, thousands of them funded by the federal government because people stood up and said, you want to talk about decriminalization? We were going to shift the conversation. Why is, I mean, can you imagine all the time that the media and, and politicians have spent debating a sort of meaningless term, decriminalization. What about if we debate the idea of increased program funding for local community action groups, for local parent education? I mean, all the time we're spending talking about Portugal, for God's sake, we could talk about um, let's, how do we fund, where can we find some money in government? Because let me tell you something, if the people want this to happen, if, the, if you get up together, it can't be Bernie on her own. It can't be your rat on its own. It can't be one Garda commissioner on their own. It has to be parents in all the communities coming together and citizens demanding to the government, we, you will find money to do this or you will not be elected. And we want you to do this because it's ravaging our communities. It's the only way it's going to happen. It's not going to happen if we just kind of sit and wait. Well, we hope they fund teachers more this year, and then we want the curriculum to ha add one more week, and then maybe we can. It can't happen like that. It has to be, I think, a grassroots effort pushing the politicians. That is how I think that things will change. Okay, thank you. We've quite a few people who want to come in. There's a lady down here, and then I shall come to you afterwards. Okay. Oh, sorry, Bernie, you wanted to say yeah, something? No, Des, 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 I'm sorry, Des. Yeah. I just wanted to e echo what Kevin was saying. Because let's face it, it was people like yourselves who shut down the head shops, who stood up and said, we do not want them in our towns, in our cities. Uh, having seen the horrendous program, uh, the program was brilliant, but the horrendous pictures in the program that Keelan uh, produced for prime time uh, of the head shops being open at three o'clock in the morning, the queues outside and things like that. It was ordinary people stood up and said to their politicians, we want this changed, and it worked, and the Psychoactive Substances Act was brought in. And that just shows you what you can do. Not people like me, you. I was trying to do it from the inside, half an hour on Joe Duffy, and it was sorted. Thank, thanks, Des. Um, th this lady at the back of the room. Hi, my name is Lance McCauley. I'm part of a group called Parents Making Children Aware. And we do drug education in schools, in primary schools. Um, we are funded through the Department of Education and the ETB. Um, it is there, there's just not nearly enough of it. We work with the teachers and we complement the Walk Tall programme. Um, but it needs to be in every primary school. We're a group of parents that trained, we spent a long time training and we can do this work. Um, the difference of us going in is that the children will be more inclined to open up to us, whereas if they have a teacher in the classroom, they can be a bit nervous around saying things or asking questions. But you will be really, really surprised at how much information and knowledge that the children have around drugs from very young in primary schools. What, what age do you start with we, the children at? We what facilitate um, fifth and sixth class <coughs> children. Now, really, it should start younger than that, but our funding has been slashed over for 10 years up and running, and our funding has been slashed every year. We're down to the bare minimum now, same as most yeah. you know, drug organisations. Uh, but we'll keep going as long as we possibly can. Okay, thank you for that. There's a lady who's been trying to get in for, for quite some time. Hi, uh, I'm Anna Fanasha, I'm only a mom. You're only a mom. Just Anna, Anna will do. For all of us here, we're all parents, many of us here. 
the word primary educator is true maybe for the first three years. After that, who are we kidding? Yeah. It's actually them who's going to teach us about technology. Mom, that's not how you say it. Mom, that's not what you put it. You know, you press it here and all that. That's not, that's not on. I've been in Polis uh, because the, the school my, my children are in, from time to time, the school would have would offer uh, stuff for the uh, seminars for the parents, and they're, they're free. So here I am going there, some free time, and that I've been in, in her uh, seminars three times. But I think my 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 my, my daughter, uh, my children, because they're now fourteen, and then uh, that, the other ones now in college, have been to because my daughter said, "Yeah, we have that." But listening now, and I thought what they're getting is what I got. Listening now, it appears it's not the same. So what, we got 100% and they only get 50% because they're children, they shouldn't be exposed too much, and then we're the primary educators, we have to tell them this stuff with what? We have to up the games. Because during this age, as a teenage coming in, this is, this is where they get, this is where they get hooked. So, if you're going to educate the, the, uh, the parents who is, as years go by, bit and bit, doesn't have the hold of their children. I mean, who are you kidding? You have to educate both together so that the children doesn't say, my mom doesn't know this anyway. Or the parents would say, hmm, up to where could I tell them? They have to be educated together. It should be like a, a um, something that has to be done if you're going to secondary school. Or you don't. Okay. Like, you know, the education has to be there, a part of it. You don't, you don't um, uh, uh, finish freshman without this. No parent will bring their children without this education. So that no one could say, I was stupid, I was naive. Okay, so you, you know, very much feel that it's a joint. Well, transition here can parents be too and late. Teachers. Excuse me. Transition it 13, 14, 15. That's too late. So late in some schools, but the start they have the pu puberty. That's like they're not babies anymore. This is when they have to see it. Okay. I think you know you cannot be naive in this way, and then afterwards you're going to say, "Oh, you know." Okay. Come on. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I just would say we're, um, there's a lot of support, obviously, uh, for, for that point. We're, we're short enough on time. Uh, have we any other questions for our panel here? There's a, a lady here with a question. There's a group of us here from the panel, Cavendish Wicklow, and they've been doing the course. They've been at, John has been asked for the second time, some of them. Our big issue is the lack of special services for under 18 who are involved in children with children. We have problem. been fighting, we have been pushing, we've had interagency meetings, we have been told, we've done the list, there are two rehabilitation workers that make the whole work with the 16 to 18 year olds, if your child is younger than that, there is no service for those young people. So my question is, is this being addressed somewhere as an issue? We can expect so much of parents, we can expect so much of teachers, we can expect so much, but there is a need for special service when you have a young person who is seriously involved in, in substance misuse. And I suppose this is where you need the ministers to answer. But yeah. Bernie, in their absence, I mean, are you aware of... Because this is an issue that certainly has come up for decades, really, the lack of services for young people. Are you aware of the services, new services being put in place? Are DES, are you? Sorry, Sorry can, can I, I just say something, Sheila? Yeah. Um, we recently went to a citywide conference where one of the perks to, to decriminalisation was that any money that would be saved through the judicial system will then be redirected into... Mm -hmm like that, finding gaps in service provision and then providing more services. I thought, geez, that's a really, really great idea and that's fantastic. But the same promises were made in the States. And in fairness, I think any extra money that's presented itself in Ireland over the last while is going into a big, massive debt that needs to be paid. And in your experience in America, what has been redirected into frontline services? Nothing's been redirected in Colorado. Uh, yesterday, there's a big article in the Denver Post on the front page. You can Google it. It was marijuana growing as a number one problem in schools in Colorado since legalization. It's all the teachers saying, literally the quote yesterday, I mean, the timing couldn't have been better. It was something, I can even read it. It was like, you know, 
um, uh, we thought this was going to help us. And here we are with these problems. I have to bring it up just because I know we're short on time, but it was such a good coincidence that this happened yesterday. Um, and here it is. Um, what they said is, uh, they said, we got sold that marijuana was going to positively impact our schools, said Christine Harms, director of the Colorado School Safety Resource Center. And there is the school infrastructure aspect, but we're not seeing changes with the marijuana prevention programs, and our students are paying the price. It is the number one drug problem in schools right now, said Lean Reamer, president of Act on Drugs, a nonprofit uh, drug awareness group. At first, I thought it was similar to alcohol, said Jeff Whitmore, director of transportation for the school district, and that the kids would do it anyway and all that. But it's like now they're disguising alcohol as Kool-Aid and marketing to kids. These edibles are cookies and gummy bears, and they're filled with high amounts of THC. There's a shift in the culture. Kids see their parents smoking it. That's we haven't even talked about that. What the parents introducing young people is a huge, I don't know if that's a big issue here, but it's a huge issue in the U.S. Kids smoking and they see it marketed everywhere and they think it's normal and okay for them to do. So they're not getting the revenue back from it. And let me tell you something. There were sold this myth that in Ireland there are all these people in prison for only using marijuana, for example, and therefore will save money and give you the money. There's 136 people out of 13,600, something like that, less than 1%. And those people will probably be going anyway under decriminalization in jail because they're there for very high amounts and they sort of plead down to lower and they get a little jail sentence. So, I mean, you will be promised everything. And I would just say there are, there are funds to fund this, but you should, we should be asking, somebody should be asking the drugs minister who was here yesterday and has time to do radio and does television, ask you know what is being done for the intervention, the specialty services, which in the states we'd call the intervention services for problem um, ch you know uh, children. There, there's that you have to have your politicians answer those hard questions because they don't want to, and they really should. There will be consultation processes now um, taking place in relation to the new national drug strategy. It'll be over there, and that'll be an ideal place to. They'll be held in various communities, and you just go along, and just exactly as you've articulated there, you put it really, really well, um, and you can bring it there. And that those things are recorded, and they're brought back in, and and that it's a, it's a starter place for you. That's all I could I could say. I totally, or we, I know we and Kat would totally support what you're saying. Okay, thank you for that, Bernie. Okay, I, I, two more questions, and then we are going to break for lunch. So this lady here, and then the gentleman in the, the second last row. Okay, okay, three more questions, and then we break for lunch. Hi, uh, my name is Sue Moore, and I'm a forum coordinator for a number of community groups. I'm also a parent of three, and um, my 16-year-old son is currently using marijuana, with he hates spread kind. So it's a personal question as well as a community-based one. Uh, I suppose what I'd be worried about is if marijuana, yeah, I'm in favour of decriminalisation for, um, I wouldn't want my son to end up in prison for being caught with over time, but my worry is that, that if decriminalisation happens and the government process is left in the hands of the pharmaceutical companies, we're leaving that open to the misuse as we've already seen with methadone and benzos. Um, and I'd be worried, I suppose, if looking at the side effects of so many drugs that are prescription drugs and looking at the side effects of them, are people much more safer taking illegally homegrown cannabis or will they be safer with a pharmaceutically manufactured, medically available version of cannabis? Great, maybe Des would address that one, yeah. It's an interesting question. As far as I'm concerned, neither. Neither, okay, that's a pretty... Uh, Neither. Neither. I mean, the point of the site of to do what I was talking about with the Sativex, it doesn't get you high. I mean, no child is ever going to want to use Sativex, right? No child's ever going to want to use Epidiolex. There's no THC in Epidiolex, actually. So the point is, for those that are truly seriously ill, we owe it to them if they're going to use cannabis for pain relief or whatnot. We have to have something that has some quality standards, but it doesn't get you high. So absolutely though, we should use, you know, the example of prescription drugs to know that even if they're prescribed, they're often, I mean, in the U.S. we're 300 people a day dying from prescription opiates, number one in the world, trust me, prescription pills are a big deal to me. 
that the and the issue is for me that's an example actually of why we don't want to go down the path of legalization because even under a strict legalization which frankly would be the prescription you know you have to be a doctor to prescribe it it's somewhat strict even with that there's so much rife abuse so nobody wants a kid to go to jail for smoking a joint that's not no one's doing that right now that's not what this whole debate of decriminalization is about and so that's why i don't like that term i said yesterday can we please stop using that term maybe even the media you can help us because that uh, because it doesn't mean anything and people throw it out there and you don't even know exactly because there's no definition to it we don't want kids to go to jail for smoking a joint we want to get them help but we want to deter the use also we want the education the prevention the community action to deter use in the first place and when use happens we need to have the evidence-based specialty services and the last time I checked giving a kid a 50 euro fine for smoking a joint and telling them to go on his way was not an evidence-based way to deal with the, with the problems going on in his life. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, again. Uh, this gentleman here, second last row there. Oh, oh I'm just sorry, Bernie. I just want to back on the decriminalisation thing because n not everybody will know in the room, but CAD are opposed to decriminalisation. And it's not that we want anybody to get a, 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 a conviction or a record. We think that uh, if your child is under 18, the law, the charges can be expunged automatically if they don't reoffend within three years. If if the original charge wasn't tried in the criminal courts, and there's a third one as well, I can't, just can't remember. Um, for over 18s, it's gone back for further discussion, uh, the, the, the legislation around that, but hopefully we'll have that in the new year that over 18s can get their charges wiped clean off, off the books. The figures that Kevin gave were Irish figures. 13,000 were before the courts last year in 2014 and 136 got a custodial sentence. So the rest got all the other options, the poor box, the, pen, the probation, the, so we want to do that. And one final thing I'd say about that as well is sometimes you might have a parent who says to you, I have a child who has charges, um, I'm really concerned he's not going to get employment, he's not going to. There's an association called the Irish Association for the Social Inclusion of Offenders. And last year they got jobs for 1,200 people in construction and in manufacturing. They also got, got education and training opportunities for 2,000 people. That's in one year alone. So it's a bit of hope you could give to somebody where the, the young person has, has conviction. Thanks very much, Bernie. Uh, social inclusion of offenders, is that the yeah. name of the organisation? Yeah. It's an amazing achievement. There. I only heard about it in the last month. Yeah. This How are you? Good morning. Uh, Liam Holmes is my name. I'm a juvenile liaison officer in Chemistry Station. I've been a police officer for the last week.